Okay, hi, uh, I'm gonna try this again. Um, I had some technical difficulties the first time I tried to uh, record our help session. So I'm just doing this by myself. Uh, we did, a few, had, did have a few students uh, on the first one. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna try to cover the same stuff here and then see if we can get this posted. Um, so um, I'll come back. Um, I'll come back to the, I must spend most of the time on the second program assignment here, um, but um, um, test one was evaluated and returned. Uh, there's an example solution. Um, I'm not going to go over the, the a review of that here since we got a lot of other stuff we should cover, but you know, you really should um, take a time, uh, compare your own work with um, the uh, example solutions and things, make certain that you understand everything. I mean, that'll really help you uh, in, in you know, the rest of the class is if you, if you are you know, solid uh, on understanding of the stuff from unit one, it'll, it'll help you going forward. So, so I recommend that you do take the time if you can to go back and look at the, uh, the example solutions there. So, um, so um, I wanna spend maybe five or 10 minutes and talk about the problem set first. Okay, so um, um, as usual, you know, you can find the problem set. I usually just go over the content. Um, so we're on unit two now, the problem set will be under the, uh, the uh, chapter three um, uh, tab here, all right? So anyway, so here's the problem set. There's just two questions on this problem set. Um, the first question is, um, um, uh, kind of a written question. So, you know, to do good on this question, sorry, uh, you should um, um, you know, make certain that, that read it, think about it. Uh, I mean, you know, you ought to at least write like a paragraph or so. Um, so trying to set this up, I was, I was trying to open up my textbook. So we're referring to, I forgot that my textbook, textbook open up here. Uh, but we're we're basically figuring uh, referring to this figure. Um, it's three point nine in my textbook. It's probably that same figure, but it's the one with the um, the process states. Um, in particular, kind of actually part B here is the one that we mostly concentrate on. All right. Um, so in this question, we are talking about a question uh, um, a system with a scheduler that has both ready and blocked, but also has a suspended processes. So processes could be suspended or activated. Um, and if it's suspended, it could be in also in the corresponding ready suspended or block suspended um, state, all right? So this question is that um, uh, you can imagine a dispatcher with kind of two extremes. <laughs> Um, and, and so, so imagine that we're doing a dispatcher, a scheduler that that does things based on priority. So at one extreme, we could always just um, uh, only consider things that are in the ready state. Okay. So in that case, uh, if you have priorities, I mean, it's possible that you know you've got some processes that are suspended. That means they're kicked out of memory, but maybe they have like a much higher priority. And you have some other processes that are immediately ready, but they're lower priority. Okay. So one extreme is to just always schedule uh, ready processes, and then you know um, uh, you have to leave it to other mechanisms to unsuspend the process, to, act, to reactivate a process, even if it's a higher priority. And then the uh, the other extreme in that question is always consider the highest priority. So even if the highest priority process is currently um, actually kicked out of memory, you would select it to run next. Okay, so there there would have to be a transition. Um, from here to dispatch to become ready, uh, running, okay? Uh, all in kind of one step, all right? The, the problem with that is that, you know, it, it can be really expensive to activate a process, right? So, so even if it's highest priority, you know, do you want to do that or not? So that's kind of what this question is. And, and asking, you know, you need to think about that and give me an intermediate policy that ba balances those, okay? So kind of as a suggestion, um, um, kind of a good, idea or approach to this is maybe you could um, only do that directly activate process if it's some threshold of, of a much higher priority than than any current ready process right so maybe if it's five levels or or, or something like that of higher priority would you um, select that otherwise you would select the highest priority currently ready process all right so that's what that question is asking about all right um, 
Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about the second question. Um, this is an important question because um, um, we're going to be coming back to this bit of code here in this unit and in the next unit when we talk about concurrency issues. So you really should understand this, all right? So, so, so me, I mean, I'm going to be doing a little bit of what I'm asking you to do here. I'm going to kind of describe what this is, okay? So the re the, this is a question from our Chapter 4 textbook. Um, and you know, chapter four was about threads. So, so this is an example of a uh, multi-threaded uh, program, a multi-threaded application where we're using a threading library called POSIX pthreads. Okay, so this is not common on Windows operating systems, but Linux and Unix, uh, uh, Mac OS, uh, will usually have pthread, uh, or you can easily get it uh, for those operating systems. Okay. So pthread, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a library. So if you include pthread, um, and, and it's not object oriented or anything. So if you include pthread, you get certain data structures like this pthread T, which, which is like a pthread type, um, which is just a, um, it's really just a struct. It's not a class, but a struct. And then you get functions like pthread create, pthread join, and others, all right? So as you should learn about in chapter four, when you when you read about threads, um, um, within a single process, you can have multiple threads. Okay, so by default, when you run a process um, on most operating systems like Linux or Unix, um, it, it starts off the process with a single thread by default. All right, which makes sense, right? And and you know if you're writing C code. That single thread starts executing the main function. So you should know that the main function is a special function. That's the entry point for C and C++ programs, right? So that means that the single thread that's created, if I if I compile this code and run the resulting um, executable that comes from this code, uh, when the operating system starts running the executable, it'll create a single thread associated with that process, and it'll start that thread running right here in main, right? And the first thing I'll do basically is execute this statement here, the pthread create. Okay. So what pthread create does is it has hooks into the operating system to create a new thread. So after pthread create returns, there's going to be two threads running uh, in the original process. All right. And that's kind of what chapter four is about. It talks about what we mean about having a multi threaded process. All right. But what happens is, is that the original thread, I'm, I'm, I've got two threads, assuming there's not an error. So pthread create uh, will return error. If, if it returns an error, it will just abort. But if it doesn't return an error, there'll be two threads. The original thread will keep running in main here. So the original thread, let's call that thread one, will start executing this code to do this loop. <coughs> Excuse me. The other thread, uh, thread two, is going to start running the thread function. So this third parameter is the name of a um, function um, that that when this new thread is created, it starts running the code in that function that you give it as this third parameter here. So, so the, sa the same thread is going to be running this code, okay? So now we've got two threads within this process, um, but even on a single CPU system, um, the, 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 the scheduler can switch between those two threads that are running within the same process. So it might run a few lines from thread one uh, and then switch over and run a few lines of code from thread two and then maybe switch back. So it can switch back and forth between those, right? So it can interleave those even, even with a single CPU system. Um, you know, this, is, this is what we mean by multi-threaded or by multi-programming that you should have read about in our chapter here, right? So switching between different processes or different threads within the same process, right? Um, another thing that I'll quickly describe here that you should understand after reading chapter three, um, you know, and, and this, this state transition diagrams here, um, is that, um, for example, this sleep call is an example of, of a system call that will cause the process to block. It's, it's, a, it's an example of a voluntary way for a process to block itself. Okay? So what happens, let, let's say thread one is running. So it's running here. You know, it fetches out the value of my global, prints an O on standard output, does this F flush, and then it does a sleep. Okay, This causes that thread 
to become blocked. So, so that, that thread was the current running thread. So it becomes blocked and it's going to wait on a timer a bit. Okay. So what sleep means is that we're asking the operating system to block ourselves, to set a timer and to, to notice, notify us after, in this case, after one second. So sleep takes an integer value of a whole number of seconds to wait. <laughs> um, and then when that second is up, um, the operating system will wake that process back, that, that thread back up, we'll unblock it and we'll put that thread back on the ready queue. So it could be selected to run again, okay? So the typical kind of execution that happens is, again, you can just assume that just just a single CPU. Okay, sorry, um, continue having um, technical difficulties here. So you can just assume there's a single CPU. Um, so, so for example, a typical, I think I was saying, a typical application is, uh, execution here is um, if thread one is running, you know, we, we might do this and print out the O, and then we would hit sleep. Uh, that would cause thread one to become blocked, waiting on the, the timeout for the one second for the operating system to wake it back up and make it ready. So at that point, you know, the operating system might very well look at the ready queue and, and schedule thread two to run. So it might run, do the same thing, come down here, sleep, put thread two would be blocked for a second waiting on its timeout, okay? So a pretty typical thing you would see is these two kind of um, 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 interleaving back and forth between them, all right? If, if the amount of sleep time is about the same, um, you might expect that they would always, you know, jump from thread one to thread two, back to one or two. But there's nothing that guarantees that, okay? So in fact, um, that's one thing in question two that you really shouldn't be surprised about. Uh, because th there's nothing that's enforcing that I always have to go from one to two to one to two. Okay, so you know uh, what you should realize is that these O's are coming from the main thread that I was calling thread one, right? It prints out the O, uh, and the dots are coming from the second thread, the thread two there. Right? Uh, but yeah, you typically get, get these interleaving, but you can sometimes get two or even three executions of one of them. Um, in a row here, because remember, the operating system is the thing that's scheduling stuff. So you might have other stuff running on your system um, that, um, you know, interferes or, or um, uh, gets run in between these things. Right? Not to mention that this is probably, uh, this output came from a real multi-CPU system. So um, <clears throat> um, uh, that adds some complexity as well. So. Um, anyway, so that's, I think most everything that you need to know, <clears throat> um, or at least that's a good start on this, okay? So there's one more thing that I wanted to show you um, about the second problem for the second problem set. So, uh, there is a repository now called, uh, if you look in the additional resources, this repository on GitHub called the CS, uh, CI 430 example repository. I'll go ahead and open that up. In particular, this has examples from some of our problem sets and from the lectures and things. I might add some more here if I get a chance, but um, it, it does have the actual code of this um, uh, pthread threaded um, little application here. So um, I encourage you, I mean, you really should do this because th this is an important question to understand because we're going to come back to this, I think, as I already said, in unit three when we look at um, concurrency issues, okay? So uh, you should be able to, to, to clone this repository. You're going to have to clone this uh, using the HTTPS, okay? Um, it's not that you don't own it um, and you don't have privileges to actually write to it, but you can clone it read only by cloning the HTTPS, you know, copy that or however you normally. But then do the normal thing that you do. So um, I'll go ahead and um, get into VS Code. So however you normally clone or pause or I'll clone it in VS Code like we've been doing. Type in the HTTPS URL here, all right? Um, and I'll select, I usually put it in my repos. 
Um, and you know, we'll go ahead and open up the clone repository. Um, this now does have a dev container in here, although um, um, actually, let me, let me close that folder. So actually, after I clone the repository, uh, um, I, I put dev containers in each one of these individual ones. So you might want to try and just open that individual folder in a container. That's probably the best approach. So, so I'll close this folder. Uh, and I'll show you doing that open again. So, um, so probably the only way I really know how to do it is, is open up your command palette and do the remote containers uh, open folder in container. So find that command from the command palette. And here, since I cloned it into repos, if I go to the repos CSAI 430 uh, example, and I select the problem set two uh, example, we can directly open up that folder. It's got a dev container in there now, so it should open up. Um, and it should get, give you the option, since it, it'll detect that there's a dev container, um, I believe. So it should give you the option to reopen it in a dev container, hopefully. <clears throat> um, oh, uh, no, I, I just opened up in a dev container. Okay, so so yeah, when you do the remote container open folder in container, um, we should be running. Um, so, so now I'm running the problem set two folder in my dev container here, all right? Um, so those have got a couple of versions of the, the question problem set two, uh, but the one in the problem set two race is the one that you want for this problem set. Um, although I, I've noticed I probably should have fixed this, but, um, in the question I gave you, um, on, um, uh, in your problem set, uh, the, the loops were going from one to 25 and so one to 20. So you might want to fix that. Um, but this should have a build, uh, the, the basic build system. So you should be able to do, you know, make clean um, or control shift, C, control shift C if you've got your keyboard shortcut set up to do a make clean. And control shift B should build or, or do a make all from the terminal. But um, um, there's no like tests or unit tests on this. So to run this, you're going to have to actually run it by hand. Uh, I don't think I've got the debugger set up for this either, at least not correctly yet. So um, to run it by hand, you'll have to open up a terminal. So like do a terminal, new terminal. Um, when you do a make, um, it creates a couple of executables, but but again, the one for the basic PS02 race is, is a file, is a executable called PS02, right? So if you do a dot slash PS02, that will actually run it, okay? Um, and you should get output similar to what was shown on the um, well, the problem set that you're working on here. So, um, there you go. There it is. So, so you really shouldn't be too surprised about not getting exact interleaving, but you might want to think about this. That ought to be a bit surprising. Um, and uh, since I can. I change that to 25, you'll often get like 26 usually um, on the output there. So another thing, a final thing, and then I'm gonna um, change over to the um, second assignment. But um, you know, you might want to play around with this code and, and you know try things. So, so one of the questions that's asked is what would you do to maybe fix this? So you so you could actually try and implement your fixes. So um, a, a fix would be something that actually you get kind of the expected value of my global instead of something that looks a little bit strange, like 26 here. Okay. Uh, I kind of skipped over that in, in describing this, the, the threads. Um, so, you know, another thing to note about these is that both of these loops in the thread one and the thread two are doing something with the shared global variable called my global. Right? So they're both doing something like reading the value out of my global, uh, incrementing it, writing, um, uh, an update, you know, writing a value back into it, that kind of thing. So they're both manipulating the shared global variable here, right? Um, another thing I mentioned is um, sleep always sleeps for uh, whole units of seconds. Um, it can be useful to use the micro sleep instead of sleep. So micro sleep will sleep for whole numbers of microseconds. All right. Um, so where I believe, I believe just a, a, a microsecond is um, a millionth of a second. 
So, you know, if you, if you sleep, microsleep for a million microseconds, um, you should get a similar kind of amount of time. Um, if you rebuild it, and run, run the command, you'll see that. But you can, you know, you can uh, reduce that quite a bit to um, uh, and get different behavior. So these, if it's sleeping for less, that means it's in a block state for less amount of time, um, and you'll get, um, you'll be able to kind of see different things. So if we only sleep for a tenth of that amount of time, say a thousand microseconds. Although, um, well, yeah, the, the vapor did chat. I must have had a different amount of zeros in, in one of those than the other. So one, one was sleeping 10 times longer than the other, uh, probably. So. Um, yeah, I must be sleeping for like 10 seconds. I'm going to stop that. So I hit control C to, to cancel it out. Let's rebuild that. And um, I'll try that with just a thousand microseconds. So this should run a lot faster then. So, oh, in fact, it even looks kind of so you're more likely to get interleaving when they're fast like that. Uh, but again, it, it's not necessarily perfect. So sometimes you'll get two in a row, one or the other. All right, um, let's go ahead and close that off and let's go ahead and move to the second assignment then. All right. Okay, um, so let's go ahead um, and get started on assignment two here. Um, and we'll discuss a few things about it. So, um, as usual, you know, one way to find it is um, I'll go through the, the all, all the steps to getting of accepting it and getting it started as I've been doing here. So, you know, if you go to the content, look under the unit two, you should find the assignment two here under our uh, chapter four um, um, section here. So. Uh, I'm going to copy that link and go ahead and go to it so we can accept it. <clears throat> um, as usual, you should just come directly to accepting this assignment or not. So um, <clears throat> once it's copied over, the second step is to um, clone the uh, GitHub uh, URL, right? So, so I'll open up my Visual Studio code. So let's see here, and uh, we'll do a clone repository. Um, again, I, I always, I think this is a bug in Visual Studio code, but yeah, if, if you're, um, if you had a dev container open, it doesn't give you an option to go back to your uh, local, um, uh, file system because I want to actually clone it onto my local file system here. So uh, instead, I'm just going to open up a folder when it always gives you the, the show local um, option when you do open folder. So what I usually do is kind of a workaround is just open up some random local folder. Um, and then once you've done that, um, then the clone will usually give you the option that you need oh, after you have to close the folder again. So, all right, so let me try it again. So let's um, clone repository, put the URL in there. And this is what I want is, is I want it to pop up um, a file dialog for me to select something on my local file system instead of in VS code here. So I can clone the assignment to, to my repositories and we'll select that. And as usual, if everything's set up correctly, um, it should ask you if you want to open the clone repository, which you want to do yes. And then since we've got the dev container, it should ask you if you want to reopen it in the container. We can go ahead and do that as well. And then I encourage you to um, make, every, make sure everything builds um, correctly at this point, you know, so make sure the build system is working. Um, so I'll do a control shift C to do a clean, control shift B uh, to rebuild everything. And then we'll try a control shift T to run our test or we'll use the test runner. 
All right. So, you know, as usual, it should build cleanly. And when you run your test in this case, we've actually got a, a few test cases um, um, actually commented out and running at the start of the assignment. So they should run or you should be able to um, open up the uh, test runner and run. You should see that they all uh, complete. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, one more announcement about this. So I had posted this uh, just today here. Um, I found out that there were some um, bugs in the uh, uh, the test that I have. So, so maybe I should um, beef up this description a little bit. But if if you if you basically if you um, accepted the assignment kind of before three or four today, you you probably have the, the the file that's having this problem. So once you got up to like task three with this incorrect set of tests, um, it, it would still work fine on your local system. So the test would, would build and run, um, but the auto grader wasn't working because of something that I had uh, forgotten about. So we need to fix the test. So, so I did that. There's no easy way for people that had already accepted it for me to get you those changes. So what you have to do is you have to go and download these and replace your old assignment with the test with the new one. So, you know, I usually just click on that to, to like download it in my browser. Um, and um, if you're not aware, so, you know, I just open up a regular file browser, you know, so for me, it downloads into my download directory. So I've got this assignment to test, I can do a copy. And, and again, if you're, if you didn't realize it, you know, if you're following the way that I'm telling you to do it, when you first clone your repository, it clones it onto your local system. So for me, I cloned it to my local repos um, assignment to um, TMUC student team, right? And then in source is gonna be the old assignment test and I could paste my new one there, right? Just completely replace it, okay? But the point is, is that this local file system, this, this local um, directory, the assignment to directory, um, is actually shared, share mounted with the uh, dev container, right? So when you run it in the dev container, these are the exact same files. So, you know, you might have to close the file and reopen it. But if you put your new one in there um, and then you go into your dev container and look at that assignment to test after you copy it on there, um, and you might want to rebuild, make certain it rebuilds and, and uh, everything. So I'll try to do a clean and a build with the new one here. Uh, but one way to recognize this is I had to change um, um, instead of having like multiple separate test sec test cases. There's there's now like one test case for each of the tasks inside of them. There's multiple sections. So that's what the new one looks like. That that fixes the uh, the the problem with running these on GitHub um, the way we did those. So. All right, but yeah, it should still build, um, and you know we should be able to run the tests. All right. Um, my file browser here. So in this assignment, I'll look at the assignment description. Uh, we're, we're basically building a um, simulation of um, of of the the part of the system that manages processes. So we're basically simulating kind of the main three state part of the 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 process model from our chapter three. So that's ready running block. But we're also, uh, you know, in the simulation, we can create new events um, uh, and a new event then immediately becomes ready. Uh, and then we're gonna uh, have a simple round robin scheduler so that uh, we look at the, we're gonna keep a ready queue and we'll look at the front of the ready queue whenever the CPU is idle to select the, the process at the front of the ready queue to dispatch it, to make it become the running process. Um, I probably should have left up my textbook here. So um, let me open up that figure one more time um, uh, while I'm discussing this, right? So we're basically kind of implementing um, the ready running block, but you know we can create new processes in the simulation. Uh, and we, uh, we can also simulate um, you know process finishing up, so exiting the system, right? So when new processes come in, we need to have a ready queue in the simulation. Whenever the CPU is idle, there's nothing running, the dispatch will run. So we'll look at the process that's at the front of the ready queue and make it become the running process. That's called dispatching, right? Um, and we're gonna simulate round robin scheduling. So we, we're gonna have what's known as a time slice quantum. This is discussed in chapter three. So that a, a process, if it 
runs for uh, too long, if it, if it exceeds its time slice quantum, we will do what's called timing it out. Okay, so uh, we will force it to stop being the running process. We'll return it back to the end of the ready queue, um, and then we will dispatch another process. So in that way, you know, it's con called round robin because that allows us to um, like run a process for a little bit, return it back to the end of the ready queue, take the next thing from the front, and then that way we keep round robin kind of scheduling among a group of processes, okay? But in this simulation, we also have the concept of processes can also become blocked on some sort of IO or some other sort of event, like, you know, like a voluntary block, like the sleep that we were just talking about, right? So, you know, sometimes um, a thing that happens in the simulation is that a block event occurs and the current running process goes into a block state. And sometimes an unblock event occurs um, and a particular process then will be unblocked and put back to the right. Okay. And also we can have done events that cause a process to finish up. Right. So we're going to be simulating um, um, all those things in this um, assignment here. So um, let's just go ahead and, and get started with task one. So for task one, um, this is meant to be a little bit of kind of a warm up. So we broke it up uh, in the description to three tasks, although in the um, test file, there's just one task. So um, as usual, you should start by, you know, um, defining the, the task one uh, tests here, right? So just change that to define. Um, I actually gave you the function prototype, so the, 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 the member method prototype for all these. So you don't have to actually add in uh, any methods this time, all right? But you do have to start by, by actually um, modifying the constructor and um, to get this first section task to pass, we need to modify the constructor and also implement these three getter methods, all right? So um, basically, let's open up the header file for our process simulator here, all right? And let's look at it a bit. Okay, so in order to support the simulation of, of managing processes and, and um, transitioning them through the ready, running, and blocked, we need quite a few data structures and quite a few private member variables, okay? So we've got some data structures that we'll talk a little bit about here. We've got a process control block, which is a type map. Uh, we've got a ready queue, which we're using a list, but we're gonna use the list as a queue here. Another um, map uh, to keep track of processes that are currently blocked, all right? And we've got certain uh, member, private member variables, time slice quantum, the current system time, the next process ID, uh, number of finished processes. CPU is, is supposed to keep track of what is the current process that's running on the CPU. So we're going to be simulating a single CPU system in this assignment. So either the CPU is idle and there's nothing running on it, or uh, it has a process identifier of the current running process. Right. But to get started, we have to um, initialize the time slice quantum um, uh, member variable for our process simulator. Okay? So if you go back and look at like the tests um, for task one, so notice what we do is we create an instance of a process simulator and we pass it in the constructor, we pass it the single parameter, a uh, five here. So this, this represents what the system time slice quantum is that we're gonna use in the simulation. So we want five, time steps to be the maximum time slice quantum before we time out a process in the round robin fashion and return it back to the ready queue, all right? <laughs> so um, if you look you know, at our process simulator, there's one constructor which takes uh, a single parameter, the, the, the time slice quantum, right? So that's how we implement that. But we, we need to actually implement initializing our time slice quantum here. Um, so if you open up the implementation file, the process simulator.cpp, um, and you find the constructor, so, so the class constructor um, should be near the test, the, the first one here, at the very top of the file. Um, but whatever the time slice quantum is that's passed in as a parameter, we need to initialize the, uh, the member variable with the same, that has that same name, time slice quantum, to that value that we pass in, right? Something like that, all right? So um, this is, I, I think I mentioned this before in assignment one. So this, you'll see this commonly in a lot of C++ code. So, you know, here we've got a parameter, time slice quantum that has exactly the same name as the member variable, 
time slice quantum. Okay, so there is it's ambiguous inside of this member function. The name time slice quantum is, is ambiguous. There's two things. There's there's the parameter that has that name, and there's also the member variable, right? So this is one way that we can disambiguate it. So th if you say this um, time slice quantum, that unambiguously to the C++ compiler means that we want this is this instance's um, uh, private member variable. So, so the private member variable from the uh, process simulator class right? instance. Right? Where this, if you don't disambiguate, it's going to assume that you mean the local scope. So it's going to mean assume you mean the parameter name. Okay, so you know. Some people prefer it that way. Some some people would um, just use a different name. Um, so if you do it like that, if there's no if there's no other name uh, bear, like global parameter or local variable with the same name, then this is unambiguous, right? So it looks up the scope uh, the the to figure out what you're referring to here. So if there's no local variable by that name, it looks at class member variables, right? Um, so here, this will, it'll know that that you mean the, the class member variable, or this quantum should be uh, assigned to whatever this parameter is. Here. So either way, um, I tend to prefer it um, like that, so. All right. So that will initialize our private member variable to be whatever we have in the constructor. So for example, five, uh, when we construct an instance of our process simulator, like we're doing here for our task one task, okay? But now if you compile that and run it, um, and it should compile, um, and uh, I forgot, I don't know if I ran the test, test before, but if we, if we compile it successfully and run our tests again, You'll see that when we call the getter method, we're still not passing that test, right? We're expecting if we ask what the if to get the time slash quantum of the sim instance, uh, it should return five, right? Uh, but that's because we also need to implement the getter methods, uh, like I talked about. So if we find the get time slash quantum getter method here, it, these are hard coded just to return um, a constant value, but we really need it to return the mem private member variable. Again, here's another um, uh, example of what I was talking about. So there's no local variable or um, parameter called time slice quantum. So there's no an, un, there's no ambiguity here. What I mean. So th this since this method is a member of the process simulator, uh, this has to refer to the time slice quantum uh, member uh, variable. So if we rebuild what we're expecting here, if we rerun our tests, um, um, since we just implemented the get time slash quantum, and since we're um, we're initializing the time slash quantum to five, we should be able to pass that first test there. And in fact, we do, right? So we're passing that one, but we're, we're um, not passing the next two. Right? So the next two, um, <clears throat> These are just going to be the, the the simulation should always start off that the next process identifier, uh, the, you know, the first process identifier for the first new process is going to get a process identifier of one. The second one would be a PID of two, three, and then so on. Right? And the system time is going to start off at time one, right? And every CPU cycle time will go up increment in a whole unit, one, two, three, four, five, right? Um, and again, these are both. Um, the, the next two member variables of our process simulator, right? So we just need to initialize those both to one and return those um, in our getter method, get, get next process ID and get system time here, right? So if we go back to our constructor, <clears throat> we can initialize these both to one and, and just for, um, for symmetry, I'll just keep using this, even though there's no ambiguity for these names, so I wouldn't necessarily have to, but um, so system time and pro next press ID both would be set to one, um, but we would also need to set the getter methods uh, for these to correctly return the value. Oops. Of our next process ID and our system 
right? So if I did everything correctly there, that should be enough to pass the, uh, the, the first part of task one here. So um, in particular, though, if we go back and look at our first um, <clears throat> section, we are now passing those three getters, all right? Um, so the remaining part of task one then is um, Um, we need you to um, implement the get number of active processes, all right? So um, the way to implement get number of active processes is we're going to be keeping the processes in the process control block, okay? So you can determine how many processes are currently in the system by querying the process control block to see how many processes are currently in it, all right? So um, let's look at what that process control block is again, all right? So we're gonna be using what's known as a, um, a map for a process control block, all right? So this is basically, um, uh, you might know it as a hash or a dictionary. This basically uh, maps a key to a value, okay? And uh, initially, um, when we construct a process control block, it's gonna be constructed as empty, all right? Um, and you might want to, you know, um, I think I've shown this before, but um, um, uh, you might, I recommend the um, c++.com, it's usually the top reference if you do something like Google for STL map, C++ STL map, right? Um, but um, uh, the, the, the map function um, has all of these member operators. So some things that you're probably gonna need to use is I'll show you how to use the um, indexing operator, but you can actually ask if the map is empty or not, gas for its size, okay? So it's a really what you want um, is the size in, in order to implement um, um, the get number of active processes, okay? Because if you ask the process control block what its size is, you know, if there's one process currently being managed in the system, then the size will be one. That's that's the number of active processes, right? Um, and while you're at it, you probably should go ahead and, and implement the get number finish process, but we don't have a, we, we could add in like another map, um, like, like a finish list or something like that. We, we didn't do that. Because basically what we're going to do is when a done occurs, we're just going to remove that process from the process control block, and we're just going to increment the um, num finish processes uh, member variable, right? So, so we're, we're, we're just going to throw away the, the process structure um, and, uh, and, um, uh, and just keep track of how many processes have finished so far with the member variable, all right? Um, one other thing, before I go off there, I should have mentioned that um, um, I, I will show this here, but this process control block maps um, process IDs to processes, all right? Um, so what that means is something like this, right? As, as is shown here in the description. Um, you can use the process control block uh, kind of like an array, right? So, so if you give it, since we're mapping process IDs to processes, uh, if you index by a process ID, and if that process um, ID exists as a mapping between a process ID and a process, it will return an instance of one of these process objects, okay? So from there, you know, you might want to, uh, at this point, you might want to um, look over. So there is another class called process um, in our um, simulation here, which which holds all the information about a single process that's being managed um, in the simulation, right? So processes have information like what their current state is, ready, running, blocked, um, the, the the process identifier, the, the time when it started, um, and it keeps track of some um, um, things. So in, in particular, it keeps track of the, the amount of time slice quantum that it's used in its current um, dispatch cycle so that we can tell whether it's been um, um, whether it's exceeded as time slice quantum or not. Right? 
Um, also, you know, processes uh, they can be end up being put into a blocked state, um, and at that, uh, so we have to remember what event um, the process is waiting on that's blocked on, so that we can unblock it when that event occurs. But the, this is a, a full class, so you can also call. Uh, uh, methods um, on a process instance, all right? So you can make a process ready or dispatch. So these are mostly what you want to do. This, is, this has mostly been written for you. You just need to call the correct method to um, make the process ready uh, at, at the point in the simulation where a process has, a new process has been created um, and we're about ready to, to make it uh, ready and put it on the ready queue and so on, all right? Um, Or as an example, of that. so here was an example of that. So, part of creating a new process when we do that um, on step two, the new event is where we create a new process. Uh, but you'll be you'll want to do something like this. So after you create the new process, uh, you want to make it ready so you can put it on the ready queue. So here, this you know, if if, if we just created process one, we we create process one, put it into the process control block, so we can access read process one back out of the process control block, and then call any of those methods on the process like ready. Um, um, or uh, whatever other process, whatever other methods there were that were defined for the process. Um, you don't have to initialize the process control block. It, it will it will start off empty, but you can ask the the process control block for its size immediately, and the size will be zero initially. All right, so. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to be giving any more code here, but but um, the um, in our process simulator, um, get number back to processes. So, so this is where um, you need to query the process control block um, and return the number back to processes. All right, but um, the, the the process. I mean, you know, you shouldn't um, you shouldn't just you know, the, the very first time that we call get number back to processes, it returns zero. I mean, so you could get this test to pass by returning zero. So we build it um, and we run the test. Right, and it's, and it's passing. We could do the same thing for the get number finished, right? So. Uh, we could actually get the test to pass by hard coding in the correct value that the test is expecting. So you now notice it does a rough path. But you, you, you really shouldn't skip over this yet. So you should actually do the actual implementation for these, all right? So um, um, to, the get number of finished processes um, is kind of similar to the system time and the next process ID. So in, in that case, you should just simply that there's a number of finished processes member variable. So you should initialize that to zero in the constructor and then return the number of finished processes in the get number of finished processes um, uh, getter function. All right. Um, but for um, um, so, so, I mean, yeah, you shouldn't return zero, you should return the, the number of finished processes there. But for the get number of active processes, what you want to do is you want to um, um, query the process control block itself, right, uh, to ask for its size, right? So if you ask for, so if, if you create a, a map like this, my map, and you add three processes here, we're adding three um, key value pairs of, of where the key is a character and the value is, a, is an integer, right? But if, if you ask for the size, after adding three items into it, the size is going to be three, right? But, but yeah, so whatever whatever number of processes we, we've created and put in the process control block, that is the number of active processes, right? And so only active processes are ever going to be in the process control block um, in our simulation, all right? Hopefully that makes sense, but that, that should be able to get you to implement those two. Um, and then likewise, um, the, the last three things is to implement um, uh, some of the things in preparation for using the ready queue, all right? So the ready queue, um, um, 
there's uh, another data structure called ready queue. Uh, it's actually a list instead of a queue. There are queues in a standard template library, but we're using a list for reasons that you'll find out. Uh, but since it's a list, uh, you know, um, um, let's look up uh, the, the list data type here. So if we go to cplus.com and look up our list class, um, you can actually treat lists like um, stacks or like queues by using the correct the, the particular method, right? So if we want to create, if we want to treat our ready queue as a queue, we're going to be pushing things to the back. So you'll be using push back whenever you want to put something onto the ready queue, um, and you want to use uh, pop front when you want to uh, remove the item from the front of the queue. Okay. Actually, you need to do two things to to get the the item at the front of the queue. Uh, you first have to call um, um, uh, front. So front actually reads the value, but it leaves it on there. So it's, it stays at the front of queue, but it tells you what the front value is at the front of the queue, right? But, but uh, normally what we're going to be doing is we're going to be um, dequeuing the item, the, the process identifier at the front of the queue. So we, we need to first read it off using front, and then we need to, to do a, uh, um, a pop front to delete that item off the front of the queue, all right? But yeah, anyway, I mean, to treat it like a queue, you're going to be pushing things on the back and you're going to be getting the item from the front and popping the item from the front when you're taking items off the queue, all right? Um, so, Back to looking at our tests here. So there are three more tests here um, that um, three more uh, functions that you should implement. But again, you shouldn't implement these by just returning back what is what is, is expected. You should go ahead and, and, and get these so that they'll be working in the future, right? So to get the ready queue size, you need to do a similar thing like we did for the number of active processes. So you just need to query the ready queue for its size. And you know, if, if there's five things on the ready queue, then the size will be five, right? Uh, now, and then you, you can simply use the front and the back accessor methods to um, uh, get the item at the front or the back of the queue. Although there's one uh, wrinkle on this is that uh, front and back are not safe. If the queue is empty and you, you ask for the front item, it'll actually cr crash your program. So um, if, you, you first have to check if the, the queue is empty or not. So again, you can use readyqueue.empty to check whether the queue is empty or not, right? So if the queue is empty, you want to return idle, a special process identifier that means like a, a, a null process or non-existent process. And if the queue is not empty, then you want to uh, return the item at the front, you know, by accessing front or the item at the back, if we're getting the back item on the queue. All right, so that's how those will work, right? And and I might have skipped over here, but you know, the, again, we're we're not using a list of actual process entities uh, or, or a queue of process entities. We're, we're using a queue of process identifiers. Okay, so when you take off a process identifier, if I need to look it up uh, to get the actual process instance, I would have to ask. I'd have to to get the process ID off the the ready queue, like the front of the ready queue, and then use that process identifier to index into the process control block in order to actually send messages to that process, you know, to make it ready or time it out. You know, again, um, 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 kind of as was shown as example here. So if I got a process identifier off of my ready queue, like from the front, if, it, if the process was one that, I, that was at the front of my ready queue, I'm going to dispatch it. Um, I could, you know, uh, take that process identifier, index it into the process control block, and then call dispatch on the process to, to actually make it the running process to, to dispatch it to the CPU, right? Um, all right, and then um, um, we, you're going to have to do something similar for the blocked list size, like you did for the ready queue size, uh, but you really don't have to do that quite yet. You, you can that one you can kind of defer until we get to where we're doing the block event uh, and the unblock event. So this should be returning back uh, um, 
um, should be returning back zero um, for that method um, for the uh, get uh, the, the block list size here. So, but yeah, you can leave that for now and, and skip it. And that should be enough once you get the, the queue and the uh, number of active process, number of finish, finish process for the uh, um, process control block, that should be enough to get these to be passed, all right? Um, then for um, task two then, uh, I broke it up into two parts. So in the first part, you need to implement the uh, basic new event. All right. Now, um, I didn't give these to you. So now you do have to actually uh, put a declaration um, in the uh, the header file first, um, kind of like we did on a previous assignment, and then put the implementations in. And, and again, you know, when you're adding these in, make certain you add those into the correct place where the uh, you know where, where its function documentation is, right? So so here down here below um, the this is in state are all of the function documentation for the, the new event, um, the dispatch, um, um, CPU cycle, timeout, and so on, right? And all these, I, I mean, you know, may, maybe I could have given these, the, the signatures uh, for these, but I mean, all these are pretty much the same in that they are all gonna be void functions uh, that, that don't take a parameter, although the, the block and unblock take one parameter, but most of them don't take any parameter. So, so the this first one um, that you do for task two, new event, um, is a um, is a void function, doesn't return anything, and it doesn't take any parameters as input. All right. Um, so what you need to do to get the first part of, of the task one done um, uh, and passing is um, is um, after you do a new event on the simulation, the, the next process ID should have been incremented uh, and the number of active processes should have been one. So it should now be one. It was zero before, it should be one now, okay? So to do those first two things, uh, this one's relatively simple. You do have to increment next process ID uh, inside of new event, right? Um, although that's probably the last thing that you wanna do. Uh, before that, though, you need to create a new process and put it into the um, process control block, all right? Um, and as a hint, and, and I think I'm going to kind of mostly give that to you right here, um, although I'm just going to write it, um, well, I'll kind of write it right here. So to do that... Um, you you want to create an instance of a new process, but you'll want to use the particular constructor that was that was uh, given to you for these processes uh, at this point. So basically, again, if you, if you go back to the um, um, process header file, um, there's two constructors, kind of like a default, but there's one that takes a process identifier and a start time, right? So that records uh, uh, when you're creating a new process, it sets up what the process identifier is for the process and what the time was in the system when it started, right? So you should be using this constructor most uh, for, for the new event here. Um, um, so so um, this um, um, would create an instance of a new process here, right? So, so that would be kind of all you need to do, but then what um, you need to get that into the process control block, all right? So the next process ID, you know, uh, if the next process ID for the new process we're creating is one, um, we can add that into the process control block. Um, something like that. I believe that should basically work, right? Because you know, here we're creating a new instance of a process, and then we're going to add that, new, and, and we're initializing it uh, with, with the, the the initial things that we need for the process to to know about itself. Um, and then we add that we make a mapping. We add a new mapping between the process ID, whatever the next process ID is, 
for the new process that we're creating and the new process. And then you have to increment the next process ID, all right? So that's the basic thing that happens in your new event. And, and if you do those things, um, then that's enough to get it past these two first tests. You know, so we're expecting uh, after you create the first new process that the next process ID should be two for the next new event. Um, and that there's one process now in your process control block. Um, so the second part, the main thing about the second part is you have to implement the uh, get process here, all right? Um, so, um, I was trying to reload my window there. I don't know why. Sometimes the intelligence takes a while to kind of update. Um, there we go. So, um, so the second part of task two is is really to get this Git process working here, right? So this is kind of described here, uh, but basically, oh, and, and I kind of gave you the signature. So this is another one where I didn't give you the signature, but I have it here in the assignment description. So get process, uh, if you give it a process identifier, it's gonna return a reference to a process, all right? So to do that, you should be able to just directly use the process control block, right? So because the process control block will give you a process uh, if, uh, if you, uh, use the indexing operator by the process identifier, right? And in this one, I didn't ask you to do any error checking, so you don't have to worry about if um, that process identifier doesn't exist. We're mostly using get process for testing purposes rather than something you would do with an actual simulation object like this. So, so for the most part, you can assume that the process identifier is gonna exist if we call get process, right? Um, so, I mean, it's supposed to look like this. So, so you know, after I did the new process, uh, the, the new event to create process one, I should be able to call get process and I will get back an, uh, a reference to a process object. And I should be able to call the things like the get PID, you know, again, you can look at the, the process header file, but you know, we can call it get PID and uh, any of these other methods um, um, on our process uh, instance here. Um, so yeah, and the the if we ask it to get process one, the the process identifier for that process we get back should have a PID of one. Right. Um, so then there's some other thing. Once you get get process working, you, you do have to go back and add a few things to the new event. Okay, so um, after you create the new process, but before you put it into your process control block, you have to make the process ready. Okay, so you're going to have to call um, ready on the, the on the process here. That that's that what that's what puts the process into the ready state. All right, um, and add, um, after you make the process ready, and then you need to add it in the process control block. Kind of one final thing is you do have to also add that process identifier of that new process onto the back of the ready queue, right? So after we create this new process, we're expecting that we've added process ID of one to the ready queue. So now the ready queue size would be one, and there's only one item on the ready queue. So the process identifier, both the front and the back, um, is also one after adding that first new process, right? Um, and then here you see that, yeah, if, if you had a second process, this is everything you would expect uh, to have, have happened after the, uh, a second new process is created because of a new event. Um, now the next process ID is three, the number back to process two, because there are not two processes in the process control block. The ready queue now has two processes on it. Um, the one is still at the front, but that new process two is now at the back of our queue, all right? Um, all right, and then I'm going to go a little bit faster through the rest of these. Um, but um, uh, task three is to implement the dispatch function. In fact, I might just uh, 
uh, read through the assignment description here. Um, I, don't, I don't think I broke. Um, um, oh yeah, I did. So task three was another one that we broke into two different parts. But after that, I think everything is back to just having one part here. So for the first part of task three for dispatch, uh, I ask you to to first uh, implement. Um, Uh, the is CPU idle um, and the running process, um, but also you should initialize the member variable at this point uh, called CPU to be idle initially. Okay, so the, the in order to implement is CPU and running process correctly, um, you first have to initialize the CPU. Uh, to, it, it, its initial state in a simulation is going to be idle. There's nothing running on it initially okay so again that's as easy if, if if you're not following this is that you know we've got another member variable called cpu but it just holds a process identifier right and initially the cpu should be idle right so we we declared a um, um in in the process states here uh, if you're interested we've got an enumerated type um no, sorry in, in the the process header file uh, we declare some uh, particular constants. Uh, in, um, uh, in particular, you know, we're using zero as a special identifier to, to mean a, a non-existent or an idle process here, right? Um, so, you know, uh, initially, if we go back to the constructor for a process simulator, I mean, that's as simple as Um, initializing the, the CPU when we construct our process simulator to be idle initially, right? So it starts off at idle. And then to implement um, um, is CPU idle, you just check that member variable. So if, if, if the CPU is idle, then you return true. And if it's not idle, your turn false, right? And running process is even simpler, so we should maybe done that first, but you just return back whatever the process identifier is of the running process. And, and again, you know, that that CPU holds the running process, and that'll be either idle or it'll be like a valid process identifier, one, two, three, you know, whatever the process identifier is, right? So again, if you go back and look at the tests, um, After creating two new processes in a, in a sim, uh, I mean we haven't actually run dispatch or anything, so so the um, the CPU would be idle initially, right? So if you ask what the running process is before you call dispatch, you should get idle back. And if you ask if, if the CPU is idle, it should be true, right? So, so this is a, this is saying that uh, oh, is CPU idle? Should return a boolean result, true or false? If I didn't make that clear, right? So. So um, it should return a true result because the CPU is currently idle when we first start our simulation. Okay. All right. Um, and then um, um, once you get those, you'll be using those methods for the dispatch. Okay, at this point, I'm going to because we still got we still got Wednesday and, and Thursday to talk more about these. Um, so I'll talk in some more detail about um, uh, maybe the rest of these. We'll see if people have questions. But but yeah, once you get if you if you can get this far, uh, once you implement the dispatch, you're making some good progress. Okay, so I, I did give some some um, pseudocode for the dispatch okay so basically you should be reusing the the is cpu idle whenever there's pseudocode like checking if the cpu is idle or not idle right so you know the 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 what happens in dispatch is that um, um dispatch should only do something when the cpu is idle so when the cpu is idle it should um get the next process from the head of the ready queue and dispatch it, make it the running process. Okay, that's what dispatching means, right? So uh, if the CPU is not idle, that means something's running, so um, we can just uh, return, right? So again, this is gonna be a void function. It doesn't take any parameters as input. So if it's not true that the CPU is idle, just return, right? Likewise though, I mean, if, if the CPU is idle, that means we would like to run a process, but, it can be the case that the ready queue is empty, 
right? So if the RAID queue is empty, there's no process currently ready to run. So the CPU is going to have to be idle uh, because there, there's nothing that we can schedule um, and dispatch um, on the CPU, right? So if the ready queue is empty, then we also just return immediately, right? And again, you can use the uh, uh, empty function for the the the, uh, the list class to determine whether the ready queue is empty or not. Otherwise, you know, if, if you get past those two kind of checks, that means that the CPU is idle, but there's one or more processes on the ready queue waiting to run, right? So to, to, at that point, what you have to do is you have to get the, uh, get the process identifier um, at the front of the ready queue. So, so you have to use both the front and the, the pop front to get the PID off the front of the ready queue. Set the CPU to be now to be running by setting it to be, uh, to, to be scheduled with that process identifier that you just pull off the ready queue. But then you also have to call the ready method, or sorry, the, the, um, um, the dispatch method um, on that process. So you have to look it up in the process control block um, and call dispatch, all right? So again, you know, to look it up in the process control block um, is the same like, like um, uh, uh, we showed here. So whatever the process ID is of the process you're dispatching, you would look up at the process control block and then you would call some function on it. And in this case, um, for the dispatch method, um, I believe, let me make certain that's true, but I believe that um, these end up using the same names. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the process header file, um, it's got ready, it's got dispatch. So um, in the new event, you're going to be calling ready. Uh, in the dispatch function, you're going to be calling dispatch. Uh, in our next function for CPU cycle, you're going to be calling CPU cycle for the current running process. Um, in the timeout method uh, for the simulation, you'll be calling the timeout of the process and so on. Right. Um, all right. And uh, so let me go ahead and, and, and wrap up. I'll just mention you know, real quickly about the rest of these. So once you get to that point, um, I think the rest of these should go relatively quickly for most people, but we'll talk more about these in, in more detail in our next help session. So the remaining thing is to implement the CPU event member method. So this is, again, is a void function that do doesn't take any parameters as input. So this is just simulating work being done, right? So basically the system time should increment and if there's a, um, only if there's something running, so if the CPU is not idle, then we also have to call um, the CPU cycle um, on the current running process to have it uh, update its um, amount of, total amount of time that's run and update its time on the current time slice quantum, right? But this is important because this keeps track of how many time slice quantums in the current dispatch cycle um, it's been running so that we can implement timeout correctly. So for timeout, um, you know, if, if the CPU is idle, timeout is, is if the current running process has exceeded its time slice quantum, um, it's not being blocked, it's gonna be returned back to the ready queue. So we're going to make it uh, stop, have it be the, the running process and put it back to a ready state um, and insert it back to the end of the ready queue, right? So, you know, if, if there's no process running, then there's nothing to do. So if the CPU is idle, just return. Otherwise, that means there's a process running. So um, uh, use the, uh, the method to check if the, the time slice quantum is exceeded or not, right? And again, that is a method of the process class, right? So this is our process class here. So you can ask, is time slice is, is quantum exceeded for the current running process or not? And that will return you true if it is or false if it's not, right? And, and you do have to pass in the system time slice quantum to this function here, right? Uh, but yeah, if, if the process needs to be timed out because it's exceeded as time slice quantum, then you have to time it out. So you have to call timeout on the process. So that's the, uh, the timeout function. So in this function, in this, um, member method that I'm talking about, you're going to be calling both two of them. Is quantum exceeded? And if the if and if it's true that the quantum exceeded, you're going to call timeout on that same process, right? 
Um, and you have to do kind of the reverse of what we did for the dispatch. So you have to um, put that process ID back onto the back of the ready queue. Um, and then you have to set the CPU to be idle now because the, it was running something, but that process timed out. So now the CPU is idle. All right. Uh, and then block and unblock event um, are going to simulate, you know, uh, the running process becoming blocked or some block process becoming unblocked and being put back onto the ready queue. All right. So um, for block event and unblock event, we actually pass in a parameter for these two. We pass in the um, event ID that, that occurred that caused it to block or the event ID that occurred um, that's unblocking something, right? Um, so this is kind of the pseudocode for the uh, block event. Uh, here, this is the first time where we actually do some error checking. Um, so, so you do have to check some things and throw some simulator exceptions. We did that in the first assignment. So basically we consider it a simulator error um, if a block occurs when the CPU is idle. Okay, so it should never happen. I mean, it doesn't really make sense. Uh, we could just ignore those, but in our simulation context, um, you know, you can't have like some event happening if there's nothing running to cause uh, an event that might block the running process, right? So we, we consider that a simulation error. So if the CPU is idle uh, and block event is called, you should throw a simulator error. Um, it's also an error that we're only going to allow one thing at a time to be blocked um, on a particular event ID. So uh, we're going to keep track of which process is blocked on which event um, in the um, uh, in this blocked list. Okay, this is another map, but it maps an event ID to a process ID, right? So um, to do that second check, you, you can you can look up in the block list to see if there's any um, process ID uh, that's waiting on that event ID. So that's how you implement um, this one. So if the block list already has something waiting on that event ID, then we throw in a similar simulator exception. Okay? Because again, we're not going to allow two or more things to be waiting on the same IO event or um, um, event of some kind. Right? Otherwise, then you can do these steps. So we can look up the current running process in the process control block and call block on it. Uh, and then we need to enter, this is where you actually enter in um, a new entry into the blocked list, right? So you need to make a mapping between that event ID that, that the block event was called on and the process ID of the current running process. And then you have to set the CPU, um, the current running process to be idle. Um, unblock does kind of reverse, um, although there, there are also some um, error conditions on this. Um, so it's not an error like before. I mean, unblocks can happen even if nothing's running on the CPU because things are waiting and, and events can occur even if nothing is running on the CPU. Uh, but we do consider it an error if an unblock occurs for an event that doesn't have any process currently waiting on it, right? So uh, if, if event ID 5 occurs, but no process is waiting on event ID 5, we, we consider that shouldn't happen in our simulation. So that is, should throw an exception on the case. Um, otherwise, you kind of do the reverse of what we did here. So you have to look up the process of the control block, call unblock on it, um, and then make that process ready again. So you have to put it back onto the ready queue, right? Uh, and then finally, for the done event, um, um, it, again, it's considered a, an error in the simulation. You can't have done events occur if nothing's actually running on the CPU. So if the CPU is idle, you should throw an exception. But otherwise, then whatever the, the process that is running um, is actually exiting the system. So at that point, we, have, we need to remove it from the process control block um, and increment the number of finished processes, that member variable, which is the only thing we used to keep track of the number of processes that have exited the system so far. All right. Um, and there's a few more things. This is already uh, long enough um, for this uh, discussion here. Uh, we'll go into more details, um, uh, especially maybe we can give some more examples of using like maps, like the block list and the process control block and things like that. Um, uh, but we'll do that on Wednesday. Um,
but uh, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and, and stop this video and I'll go ahead and get it posted here and uh, keep your questions coming if you have them. Uh, and I'll see you guys later then.